All right, thank you very much for coming to the show uh, and for some of you staying on for the next one, so thank you. Uh, so again, as I, uh, some of you have, were here for the previous one as well, my name is Vikas Sinha. Uh, I'm one of the senior VPs in Mainframe Business Unit, responsible for, earlier I said, security. I've got uh, intelligent operations and automation as well. Uh, and with me is... I'm Jeff Henry. I've got the VP of Product Management for Mainframe Operational Intelligence, as well as you'll see me again later if you stick around for Dynamic Capacity Intelligence. I do want to just thank you all for those that have, have users participating with us in the validation programs. And if you don't, as we get into this and you want to, please see us afterwards, because that's how we really make our priority calls. So we are going to talk about uh, one of the most interesting products that we have in mainframe, uh, the mainframe operational intelligence product. And there's a lot of cool like machine learning, new technologies, interesting graphical interfaces that we're going to show you. Uh, so Jeff, do you want to take us through what overall sure. we're going to talk about here? Yeah, so we're going to set the stage with what are the trends that we're hearing from you? And then we're going to go a little bit deeper into the how are we leveraging machine learning so that we make the system smarter and we bring that intelligence to the forefront to see where we can really help from augmenting some of the automation, from bringing that data together in a, con in a convenient way. We'll go a little bit into where we're going to transform from we see a lot of customers now reacting to problems, lots of people on the bridge call, to how do we get more proactive about it. Talk a little bit about what's new in the product what's new in the solution, some of the integration areas, and then go into where we're going next. So, uh, if you've been to uh, the mainframe keynote this morning, you probably have seen this chart earlier. So in the context of you know, the modern software factory, uh, we look at what are the outcomes that our customers uh, are, are trying to achieve. And some of the, the key outcomes are, are what's listed on this wheel here. Uh, people are looking for uh, a good, secure environment to work with where it's not just the environment, but also the data that's properly protected. We spoke about it in the previous session. Uh, how do you improve you know, the agility of the platform so you can build and deploy applications more rapidly, more sooner? How do you do all of that with an increased amount of automation? And last but not the least is, all the applications that people are running, uh, you know, sit on tons of data, right? I mean, there's so much of data, there's so much of, you know, data from your instrumentation, data from your machines that's coming through. Uh, how do you leverage that to make your data center much more smarter, right? In the morning we spoke about uh, self-driving data center. So how do you really get to that point? And uh, the solution we're going to talk about really helps us, you know, in that direction where you can get your SLAs and you know, uptime 99.999%. How do you get there? Yeah, one of the most interesting pieces to me of this, of this concept isn't each one of the areas, but it's the arrows between the areas. What's the relationship between them? So I'm, we're not going to come talk to you about the, hey, here's yet another product. We're going to talk to you about how this intelligence helps us tie operational management into automation helps tie operations into DevSecOps. And then ultimately, how we help that economics piece come together, because we know all of you, like us, have that big budget tag or bullseye as far as how do you help me make this uh, economically uh, feasible and continue to actually focus on being the most economic way forward that we can predict. So a lot of companies, right, any IT company, really dreads the unplanned outage, right? When the system goes down uh, and you haven't really planned that outage, right? In the morning, you know, again, uh, referring back to the, to, to the mainframe keynote, uh, Ashok was talking about uh, Visa, right? The last time they actually did an IPL or any kind of outage was like 20 some years ago, right? So how do you get to uh, that degree of assurance, right, in, in the system? Uh, if you look at people that have actually gone through or have taken unplanned outages. There are numerous examples, right? We've got a couple examples up on the screen uh, from some of the airlines that recently had outages over the last you know, year or so. Uh, the amount of expenses that they have recovering out of those outages is huge. In addition to that, it's also you know, leaving behind a set of customers that are 
totally upset, right? I mean, their vacations are you know, destroyed in the process, their business trips are canceled. You, you really are result, you know, ending up with a lot of upset customers. Uh, you're paying back you know, money and fines for those outages. So there are revenue costs over there. Most importantly, there's an impact to your brand and reputation. And the, the whole trust that people are trying to build to, as they get towards a digital transformation takes a huge hit on, on, on getting that trust. And most importantly, we don't want to see that happen on Friday when we're all actually trying to travel home. <laughs> so a lot of times when you try to translate what's that business outcome to what are we doing from an IT and from an infrastructure standpoint, we kind of get caught in the middle with the business looking at us as a necessary evil that you guys are the reason that we actually came down. And there's a lot of scrambling behind the, how do we make sure that we can show it's not our fault? And when we've done some of these CIO studies, we see buckets of needs, buckets of customer problem or pain points into two key areas. One is around how do you manage that downtime? How do you reduce the MTTR? Or really where we're trying to go with machine learning is more of a predictive time to resolution. How do we get ahead of it so it's not chasing it from a reactive standpoint? And obviously that ties back to the SLAs. Making that connection transparent is absolutely imperative. The second piece, and it's really hitting us even more from a mainframe standpoint, is skills. We've got a lot of people aging out of the market at this stage. We've got a lot of very difficult and complex skills over the past years. How do we make that simpler? How do we make that more transparent? How do we make that communication when we look at the team collaboration across distributed cloud and mainframe systems so that mainframe can be managed like any other platform? So it doesn't have to be unique until you're coming to the what unique advantages can it bring to, the, to your strategy. So when I look at how we're looking at the market trends, we take a maturity model approach, but I'm going to give one slight twist to it at the end. So first, we're looking at, we want to move away from the expert always having to, the SMEs always having to be on those bridge calls. We've heard a lot of complaints <laughs> from your SMEs being stuck on bridge calls, spending hours of their time just to prove that it wasn't, they weren't needed in the first place. We want to move that more towards a, how does a generalist triage the initial problem and only bring in the SMEs as needed, and ideally, before it actually happens. So the first piece is around that visualization how do we bring a modern user experience so that teams work together instead of looking at you know, 50 different monitors and only knowing their own element? So once you figure that out, you want to now look at you know, what, what the normal behavior of your data center is, whatever you're tracking, right? Being able to establish that normal, and you can, a lot of you are managing data centers, right? Trying to establish what a normal is, is, is very hard, right? It's very hard, it has its own peaks and valleys. and So establish that, be able to figure out what is an anomaly, right? When do you think you got to flag something, raise an alert, because it deviates from your already erratic normal behavior. Uh, so being able to get to, to detect that anomaly and proactively take action on it, some of the, those actions could be automated, some of those actions could be manual, depending on the type of uh, issue that you're running into. And once you, you know, you, 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 if you're in a data center, again, you look at all the alerts coming in. There's hundreds and thousands of alerts that pop in, right, every single day. How do you know which ones do you run after, right? Which ones do you chase? Is there a pattern, right? Can you, can you group them together? Uh, is there a relationship between systems that can pull those uh, alerts into, into a cluster? If you can, then you can start to predict, right? If, if, I have, if I see a behavior that I know about and that's evolving, that's developing, then something is about to happen and you could proactively take actions to avoid any business uh, process disruption. And eventually, once you've got a good handle of uh, understanding when things are going haywire, you can then start to get into more of a prescriptive, right? So before something happens, I know what actions I need to take. I know what actions in the past have resulted in avoiding a downtime, avoiding an outage. So get more towards uh, uh, a prescriptive solution and, and help the user through kind of a, 
a guided uh, avoidance system. And this is where we are trying to differentiate our solution and say it's not, you've got to do step one, step two, step three, step four, and then utopia happens and you automate. So when we look at automation, we look at it in two factors. One is, let's automate along the way. So if you're doing anomaly detection in the same way that you've been automating off of static thresholds, let's do it off of dynamic thresholds. When you're doing pattern discovery, well now you have multiple alerts coming in from storage, systems, performance, and you can actually get some insight out of that, we can automate off of that. But instead of just pushing the button and having it go, part of this digital trust that Ashok talked about before with assuring systems is, we've gotta make sure you believe that we're, what we're doing. So the prescriptive guidance that Vikas went into really comes down to let's make sure that we show you what's going on behind the scenes so that you can augment that with those SME skills to say, that pattern was really good and helped me. Let's automate it moving forward. So when I talk about the data, when we talk about that first piece of getting that visualization, what I talked about last year was we brought in performance data. And we brought in performance data from our own systems, from SysView. That's what we knew best. That's what we could work with your teams on and make sure this really worked the way we expected it to work. Since then, we've been on quarterly iterations. We've brought network data and storage data in. Now we have some of the application data and the database data in. So one of the things you'll see in our demo peds as well as over in the, the distributed AO team is we brought in data from the AXA application. So how do we bridge, this isn't about mainframe for mainframe's sake. In fact, how we've, just, how we've uh, architected this is a set of microservices running in a Docker containerized virtual software appliance. It runs on mainframe, it runs on distributed, and we've got a trial environment in the cloud. So we're branching now into new areas. We'd love to talk to you about what we're doing with blockchain. Love to talk to you about what we're doing with non-CA uh, data points, like what we just announced and just distributed with uh, taking on SMF records, starting with those performance records. So we're doing all of this with some very interesting machine learning uh, techniques that we are baking into our system. So starting from, I mean, most of the data that we get is like time series type of data. So starting from very simple, uh, you know, moving averages, exponential moving averages to more complex kernel density estimation. And the system is truly a learning system. It kind of figures out when to start with a simple algorithm at what point in time it has sufficient data density to start switching over to, to you know, some more sophisticated processes over there uh, from an anomaly detection point of view. Uh, for, for pattern detection, we're putting in some multivariate uh, cluster analysis over there trying to pull alerts of various types from all kinds of systems together that belong to a family, right? They're, they're all together, right? Uh, so once you start putting those things together, you're able to evolve a causality model, right? So when, uh, in, a, in a very simplistic way, you could look at, you know, something happens in your systems and, and you're looking at the pattern. So when, uh, you know, A event happens, B happens, C happens, D is very likely to happen. Right, so why wait till all the way for that whole pattern to emerge? As we start seeing that, we can flag it. That hey, A, B, and C have happened. It's very likely that over the next you know hour or so, D will happen. Here are some recommendations. You know, start working on it so you can avoid uh, from D from happening. Because whenever D has happened, you have taken an outage. Right, so we can start looking deeper into that. And we talked about remediation earlier. We touched on it. Uh, so the system can guide a user towards, uh, you know, with, with insights on what they should be doing. We're also looking at building mechanism on where the user or SME can also give feedback on, yeah, that's the right thing to do, right? So we, have, we, we kind of are putting in a lot of machine learning algorithms to make this the, the most intelligent system out there. And when we talked about automation, if I look at that blindly the way a lot of our IT systems have in the past, the automation was tied to, can I take a SysView static threshold alert and trigger an OpsMVS action? Okay, that's still important. We want to do, we're doing that uh, off of these uh, dynamic thresholds, dynamic alerts. But we've also taken the next step and said, using the same kind of exit, how do I tie into process automation? So the one automation, the one atomic platform, the one automation platform. How do we tie into process automation? How do we tie into release automation? where people need to be involved in order to necessarily do some of the access steps along the way. 
We're also taking it then the next step and saying this isn't about ops. It's about the collaboration and work across DevSecOps. So we've got prototypes uh, at our demo stations of how we tie this with mainframe application tuner. So if you put in some bad code on Friday, and typically you wouldn't have seen it blown up until the systems came up on Monday, you can now start to see it go out of bounds from an anomaly detection, take action on it, go fire off a mainframe application tuner report, and look into where that problem is actually occurring. We'll continue to take steps in that way, bringing in other areas to bring DevSecOps together. We've also tied that then with my presentation this afternoon, and I'll leave that to there, around the economics with dynamic capacity intelligence. So when you're looking at your rolling four-hour average and you start to see something creep up, before you take the penalty to your SLA or to your budget, you can now take action against it. So what we're really looking at is trying to help change, your, change the culture. We know this is something that right now there's just an overwhelming amount of data coming in. How do you keep up? And that poor sap sitting in front of those 40 different monitors from 40 different tools, yourselves, your teams. I mean, how in the world? You got to know when that blinking red thing is, you know, a normal false positive happens every Monday when the systems come up versus the, you know, something doesn't look right in there. Let me look at what the relationship is between these three systems. We want to help move that to a much more predictive manner. So, you know, whenever I've gone and visited, you know, Kennedy Space Center or NASA, I love going into those control rooms, right? They take the tourists and you see all those panels. But really, if those are, you know, what you have in an IT data center, can you really manage, you know, especially with uh, the skills challenges that people have, uh, the lack of SMEs or having to pull them in? That on the right side is, is truly where we are uh, at this point in time. Uh, picture tells a thousand words, right? I don't need to say much about it. Uh, what we are really moving towards is, you know, faster resolution, right, if you're measuring your MTTRs. But really get away from MTTR because by the time you're getting to talk about resolution, something has gone wrong that you're trying to resolve, right? How do you get to avoidance, right? So this is really about getting dynamic alerting in time so you can measure how quickly were you able to avoid a problem that would have happened and taken you down. So that's where, you know, we see moving this whole, I mean, you just spoke about a culture, right? Trying to shift that culture uh, over there. At the same time, uh, imagine, you know, in all your mainframe shops, I know you all have challenges bringing people from outside, new talent into the company, and that particular data center with the kind of UI and the more modern, like you look at it on your phone, on a tablet, a young kid would enjoy working in that environment rather than over there. So when we think about, I think Ashok said, you know, the data is the new gold, is the new currency. And we now have all of these data points coming in, CA and non-CA, and we're working towards opening that up, opening that API up, so we're looking for customers and partners to work with us to harden it. We now get to the point where we can take these metrics and visually correlate them. So we see a lot of our customers doing this hist with historic data with Splunk to say, with these different metrics, what all happened in this one 15-minute time slice, and be able to see what the correlation of the relationship is between the two. Now that's interesting, that's good, that's a nice first step, but the next step we're taking with the pattern recognition and the correlation allows us to do some of that from the machine knowledge of seeing those patterns before. So one of the things you know I should call out here is, I mean, Jeff talked about all the various data sources, so all the CA products that we have for uh, you know, systems management, storage, network, uh, databases. So we are on a path to get all of those uh, added in here to, to be able to feed uh, data into the mainframe operational intelligence system. In addition to that, we heard from a lot of customers who said, you know what, for whatever reason, right, I don't use your, your performance management products. I have a product that's probably from your competition or I have a homegrown solution, allow me to feed in SMF records directly into the system. And so we now have a capability of introduce, uh, pulling in uh, SMF records directly into the system. In addition to that, we're also working on an open API 
Uh, in fact, we have it right now. We are using it internally. Uh, that can be used for developing adapters for additional data sources that might not be covered as a part of our other CA products. So that's an area where uh, we are soliciting and inviting customers to, to partner with us uh, to you know, bring in your scenarios into it and help us harden that open API. So if there's any interest, we'd love to talk about you know, getting you guys engaged on that. So when we, you know, that, that was a cool green highway back there, and I just wanted to spend a moment here uh, to, to talk about you know, what, what goes on behind the scenes. So there is, there is some you know, serious uh, math going on in trying to determine you know, what's the normal, when do you figure out you know, it's the, the event that's happening is, is either likely or should have been less likely, or you know what, it's really totally out of whack. Uh, how, do you, how do you go and, and alert that, right? So the, the other piece that we also do here is, it's very typical in a data center to set up static uh, thresholds. So you can very easily say, you know, I can tolerate plus or minus 10% of whatever that metric is. But is that really true? There are times you know, in your uh, uh, performance cycle or the, the, if you look at the entire time series for the, through the year, there are times where you can tolerate you know, a, a greater deviation and there are times when you cannot tolerate, right? So how do you know what that tolerance level is? And so we are able to detect uh, dynamically, establish your thresholds based on the pattern of usage, determine you know, what, what your uh, tolerable variance is going to be through dynamic thresholds. Uh, and that's really it on this one, right? Yeah. So one of the things that we've been doing through our validation programs is say, you know, if all we do is use test data to validate machine learning algorithms, that doesn't really prove a whole lot. So without your data, without actually getting customers to participate with us, we can't prove that the algorithms are doing what they're supposed to do without a bigger sample size of data. So over the past two year, year and a half, we've been working with customers, getting their data, running it through there, and then playing it back to them. So one of these customers came to us a few months ago, and they said, we had an outage last week. Find it. Just kind of put us on our heels because we hadn't done that kind of validation before. We were able to find it in two to five minutes. They looked at the timestamp, and it was two hours before anybody even called them to say there was an issue. Five hours before they had any idea where to go to look, figure out where to go with it. So that's the kind of response we're getting when people actually jump in and use this, is it's just far more intuitive, and they're not having to crawl around trying to find it in a reactive nature. So the green highway I spoke about in the previous chart, uh, that's a picture right in the center from our UI for this particular data set. And you can look at it, how simple and intuitive it is to see when something is really going out of whack there. Uh, it just makes it so easy, again, back to the skills, back to requiring uh, the, the level of expertise, right? You don't really need that, it's, yep. it's so obvious. And another customer that you heard from earlier, Greg Payne with Southwest Gas, and it's one of those that you don't have to believe it from me, you know, talk to him and what he's been able to do with some of these things. So we got the five times faster, obviously we're gonna market that everywhere we possibly can. But the key was, is it just becomes his junior assistant. So how do I get to some of these things in a more intuitive manner so that I can get the right people working on it and move on to the next optimization aspect? So let's get into what's, what's next. So we did the green highway last year. We dumped a whole lot of more data into it. So how are we getting into the next level of that pattern recognition? So when you see some of these things come in and say somebody tripped over the uh, cable and the network went down, well, the network went down, CPU went up, thresholds, our MQs all got stacked up. You get flooded with all these things. And if you go try to figure out all of these individual alerts, it's just chaos. And if you have somebody looking at network and somebody looking at systems, then they're all in this chaos. So the first piece we did is say, we've seen this game before. All that data you've been saving, let me look for patterns. So now when something comes in, they can cluster these alerts together and say there's some relationship between them and they can put a prediction on when A plus B plus C happens, we got about a 92% chance that D is going to happen. Why don't we just get ahead of it? So Jeff, this is pretty cool, but 
how do as an expert, how do I as an expert kind of give feedback that the system is really thinking correctly here? Uh, yeah, you're calling me out on the dirty little secret around machine learning, right? So the dirty little secret is mathematically, it might come up with a cluster, a pattern. But your SMEs have been doing this for a lot of years. So without taking their input in and being able to give that kind of sentiment analysis, being able to look at the logs. So when A plus B plus C happened last time, well, Ralph always does one, two, and three. So why don't you actually automate one, two, and three, or have your more generalist do one, two, and three, or sit down with Ralph and actually learn through this, because this pattern's happened 12 times over the last month. So there's much more we can do in augmenting that intelligence, and that's where we're really going next. That's where we could really use that same kind of validation and that work with our customers to know how you can consume that, how your groups would Pay, would actually participate with us here. And I think as, as you touched on earlier, right, so the SME has an opportunity to also give feedback. Yep, like what you're doing, you know, validate it. So the system learns from it. System knows when something has been validated and when something has kind of been invalidated that, yeah, when those patterns make sense from a you know, mathematical clustering point of view, but in my business sense, that cluster you're picking up doesn't make sense. Give a down vote on that, right? So the system learns the next time it doesn't need to pick, pick on that one. So we talked through some of the automation pieces before. The key here is it's not just one thing at Utopia at the end of the, a maturity cycle. It's there are different ways to automate all along the way. So here, when you start seeing something obviously going out of whack in your green highway, that's not normal. So can you automate and get the simple stuff out of the way? If you have 15 kicks regions up and one looks sick, recycle it. If there were just two or there were some access rights associated with it, maybe you don't want to do that. You want to bring it into more of a process automation so that you get the right people to sign off before you do something. And that's really when you look at what we did from an atomic standpoint, we can tie directly into their process automation scheme as well. And a lot of things that, you know, we have shown integrations here with the mainframe application tuner, with atomic, with data, con uh, Capacity intelligence, sorry. I'm like, uh, we've been using our internal open API that we spoke about earlier. So we are kind of exercising our own stuff in the process before we open it to our customers. Drinking our own champagne, right? Yeah. <laughs> so again, we talked about this as data is king. I think we've covered this. The big thing here is asking you all to participate with us. We started with SMF 70s records because people said, I want to actually get started with you around performance. You guys know how many SMF records are out there? We could spend all our time just doing that. But we're opening up an SDK for our partners and our customers to extend them as well. So we want to understand where to go next. The open API, as Vikas said, we've been using specifically within our own teams. Our dynamic capacity intelligence guys got it going in two weeks. Our blockchain folks, it was a two week one sprint uh, hackathon. So this isn't some of the months of work to actually get this up and running and try it. So the net of a lot of this comes back to the, you know, what were those IT outcomes or, or problems that we were trying to get across? What we've seen from the early validation customers is about a 40% shift in all of that SME work to a more generalist. Now these are early days, we need more support and more information from you to see whether that's really working or how to change that user experience. The two hours earlier, I mean, that was when we got challenged on it and you're looking at last week's or last month's data. It's a lot more powerful if you're actually seeing that in near real time. Then you can take issue or action on it before you ever see the outage, which is obviously what we're all trying to get to. And then five times faster, even if you just think of what your SMEs are doing and it takes them three hours today, a couple of minutes, I mean, most of the frustration I hear back is why do I have to spend all my time doing this reactive stuff when most of the time it wasn't my problem? That's the shift we're trying to do culturally. So you heard Ashok talk this morning about mainframe as a service, right? So over here, uh, what, we, what you saw with mainframe operational intelligence, it's, it's, it's not something that we're doing in isolation. So. We're really thinking of this as more of an intelligence as a service, right? Uh, there are 
other applications outside of the mainframe area that actually are using the uh, underlying framework that we created here. So if you look at the CS payment security system, and there's a whole bunch of others that are not GA yet, so I cannot openly talk about those, uh, but they have been leveraging what we have put here as an underlying uh, framework. And within our uh, scope that we are working on, we have been expanding to, to, to bring in uh, other data sources. We talked about the mainframe uh, application tuner. We are working with the security guys. So those of you who were here for the previous uh, security conversation, I spoke about the user entity uh, behavior analytics. So we're trying to combine those uh, and, and bring, bring a use case uh, using the same uh, mindset, same paradigm over here. Uh, and of course, you know everything followed by uh, automation. So it's, it's not good enough to just tell you when something is about to go wrong or something has gone wrong, like what do you do about it, right? You got to do something about it. So there is a piece of, uh, of smart and intelligent automation uh, that gets built in along with this thing. You yeah, the only you? thing that, that uh, I'd end on is again, thank you all. I would like more of us actually involved in the validation. Last year I talked about how we're investing in agile operations, agile development ourselves on three circles basically. The circle of, I just GA'd stuff, I'd love you to use it. The next one is, I got a bunch of prototypes back there, I want your feedback before I GA it because I don't want to have to maintain stuff you really don't like or you don't want to use. And then the last one is, we're designing a bunch of things, we're mocking them up on what, where we could go, but is that where you want us to go? So we want you involved in that design thinking process as well. So please join us on, on the tech talks, please join us on the demo stage, and please join our validation program. And Ashok said this morning, right, bringing sexy to mainframe, <laughs> this is where it starts, guys, right? And we need all your help. Thank you. Thanks.